Well, here we are again, and we're um, on part two of appreciating the book of the Revelation. Okay. And uh, tonight we're going to be we're going to be talking about the the judgment of the churches, and uh, it's as we've kind of uh, expressed several times. The book of Revelation is about judgment, and judgment is a good thing because uh, it lets you know where you stand if you care, um, and if you uh, if you want to live in a world that is uh, not a kind of uh, kind of mess all the time and a kind of. Uh, you know, some of it seems just incredibly beautiful, and some of it seems incredibly horrible. And uh, what do you do? And if you don't want to live in that kind of world, then you need judgment. Someone's got to sort things out. And so um, now the the whole book is about, as we've talked about in, in previous weeks, the various uh, groups or various judgment from various perspectives. And um, the, Bible, the Bible says that the, ju- the church judgment begins at the house of God, okay? And that kind of makes sense in a way, right? I mean, you know, if God has his people in the world, uh, he would, it, it doesn't do much good if the world is looking for light in the darkness and the church is just as much dark as the rest of the world. And so our job, we, you know, obviously we have a job, and part of that job is to be light in the darkness. And if we're not doing that job, then the world is going to lose something it can only get from us. So, um, and that doesn't mean we have to be, um, it, you know, we, we just have to live our lives. We just have to live our lives in uh, uh, in the process of living our lives, walk with God, walk with God as we live our lives, and then and then we will have uh, our lives will have a character which Paul talks about, which he calls an aroma of life to life to those who are who are uh, coming to life, and of death to the, death unto death to those who are perishing. We will not. Just our ordinary way of living um, as Christians will definitely uh, have an impact if we if we're faithful. So anyway, we're gonna. Sorry, shouldn't, shouldn't have eaten that last cookie. Uh. <clears throat> anyway, we're going to talk about uh, God sorting out His church, and I, I you notice I say it's His church, uh, and and. We'll, we'll see how that works itself out. So last week we talked about uh, John's vision of, of Christ, uh, the risen Christ. And uh, so, and we ended with this verse 20 here. And could someone read verse 20 there for us? <laughs> As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Okay, so the, the image that, that John gave us of Christ was that he was in the midst of seven golden lampstands and in his hand he had seven stars. And, uh, you know, you, you say to yourself, well, what are those things? And that's where everything starts. And he calls it a mystery. And that word mystery pops up a fair amount in the New Testament. And we really have to know what it means because uh, there is a theology of mystery which is totally bogus, okay? And I'm, I'm going to be a little bit uh, a little bit harsh here. Not harsh, but a little bit definite here. When people talk about mystery, they usually say a lot of nonsense, like stuff we're not meant to know or one thing or another. They just go on and on about as if God 
was, try, was just trying to keep things from us, okay? God's biggest problem is that we are so closed in on things, closed in on ourselves, that we don't get what he has to tell us. And so whenever, almost, almost every time, and I cannot think of a counterexample here, whenever we are told about, whenever the word mystery appears in the New Testament, um, it's it's mentioned as something being revealed. Okay, so the mysteries in the New Testament are always things that are being revealed. Now that that also implies that they're hidden. Okay, and uh, the hiddenness of the mysteries um, sometimes they're just hidden because we're um, um, we're spiritually dull or or whatever. Humanity uh, has not. Uh, Got this stuff sorted out. Looks like there's someone at the door. Okay. Huh. Hello. Okay. So anyway, a mystery is something hidden. And in general, in the New Testament, it is something that is hidden in order that it would be revealed. And so, in this case, he talks about the mystery of the seven stars and the seven golden lampstands. And he says that they are... The angels of the seven churches. Up oh, here we go. There's another person. Oh, good. Okay. And uh, and then the seven lampstands are the seven churches themselves. Remember that angels are messengers. Okay. And uh, I am pretty sure, though I'm not 100 percent sure, that they are the people in the churches that speak the word of God to the people. Okay. So there are people who are called and um, uh, have the role of speaking the word of God to uh, God's people, pastors, teachers. And I'm not talking about um, time servers or people who just, you know, just want a job and think, oh, well, ministry is not that much work. I can just do that. Well, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about people who... Um, who are called and set apart for God's purposes, and God gives them insight and ability to communicate. And so that's what's going on here. The messengers are... Um, here we go, another person. Oh, hi. Yes. The messengers are, or the angels are... Um, the pastors, the teachers, anybody who God has called to give his word, all right? So, so that's the way I see it, and it, it's, it makes a few things clear as we go along. Um, on, so since Christ has the seven stars, that is, those who speak the word, in his hand, and is walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, which are the churches themselves, we can know that Christ is intimately involved with his churches and can judge them fairly and accurately, okay? He knows what's going on, and we see that stated again and again. Uh, there is that sense of, of, of knowledge and involvement, and I don't know if people, ten, people really are conscious of the fact that God knows what's going on in our churches. He knows what is happening. And in particular, because the churches name his name, then he has a special uh, stake in what's going on in the churches. It's like, okay, if we're just a kind of a, uh, um, a social club, so we could maybe, maybe something like, uh, I don't know, Judeo-Christian Social Club or something like that, right? Or, or take the Y, right? You know, it used to be that the Y was called the YMCA. And before that, it was called... Anybody know what it was called before it was called the YMCA? Nobody knows. Exactly. Young Men's Christian Association, okay? But something happened along the way. And now it's called the why. And I don't know why. <laughs> All right. Well, um, yeah. So that tends to happen. 
in place in situations where um, there is not a definite commitment to Jesus. And uh, okay, well, let's let's go on from here. Okay, so um, one of the things we're going to see uh, uh, about the about these letters to the churches is that there are um, seven churches. Now, I take the position that these are representative churches. They are. There were actual churches in these cities, but um, I'm not really convinced that they were. Um, all that these are descriptions of the actual churches, and I think that the names were chosen for a particular reason, and we'll see how the the names work, uh, and and so and so um, John uses the names of the churches to characterize a kind of church that has a particular flavor to it, a particular set of qualities, and so on and so forth, and this is not. When, as I was look, I, you know, I like to kind of l- check my work a little bit and look at commentaries and such. I, I usually start off. I don't look at commentaries when I'm when I'm starting off, but I'll try to read through commentaries just to see what other people are thinking. And this is, um, I don't know. I mean, to me, it just seems like these names are really obvious, but um, I don't see many of the commentaries taking the position that these names are representative of the of particular kinds of churches. So um, I've kind of dis- I've kind of said that the, the interpretations of the names that I've come up with, as we'll get to in a minute, um, I'm I'm not I'm pretty much one hundred well not one hundred percent maybe ninety five percent sure of four out of the seven. And I am about 75% sure of the other three. And I'll kind of tell you what, what's going on here. Anyway, the purpose of the church is, to, uh, the idea is that um, there is a sort of historical pattern here too, that in a particular time, a particular kind of church would be, would predominate. And, um, but, the ch- but the other kinds of churches more or less were always there. In our time, churches of every pattern exist because we have a very, uh, um, the world is a, to use that word, diverse place where lots of different kinds of things are going on. And uh, in our country, for example, we, we are, we'll tend to have one kind of church, um, maybe the Laodicean church or, or something along those lines. In another country, they'll tend to have maybe the 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 uh, Smyrna type of church where they're being persecuted and they walk, um, walk around wondering if they're going to be you know, killed or, or whatever. And um, anyway, so in our world, we, we pretty much have all of them going at the same time. And so we get guidance for each kind of church in, this, in, this, uh, in these seven letters, okay? All right, so let's take a look at Oh, and then there's a pattern here. Um, the pattern, it, it, it's just interesting that there is such a pattern. And, you know, I wrote down the different steps of the pattern. They're not always in the, this exact order. And sometimes there, is, there are some things where, like, for example, in uh, two churches, there's no con, con that. In two churches, there's no commendation. And in two churches, there's no critique. Okay, and so that says something, um, but but these are the things that you're going to find in the in these letters, and it's kind of cool. I I don't know, just kind of a a a, a cool way to do it. Um, so he says to the angel uh, of the church in say Ephesus, right, and then the words of, and then an ident- an identification of the speaker who is Christ. So some qualities of Christ. And these qualities are relevant to the letter. You know, every time the qualities themselves uh, are, are relevant to what is the speaker says to the churches. 
Okay, then we have a commendation, a critique, and a consequence. Not, not always all, uh, like some churches, like I said, don't have any commendation. Some don't have any critique and consequence. Then there's a final exhortation and promise. And you could say to yourself, why do we have such a pattern? Oh, and there's always this phrase, um, let he who has he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, and this is one thing, by the way, I, I want to just mention this. A couple of things, actually. First, we are, we are focusing on words here. The words of, you know, the, the, the Christ, the speaker, okay? And then in the end, what we said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What's fascinating there is, what does, what does that say about the speaker? Well, we're told that the speaker is the one standing in the midst of the lampstands holding the stars, right? But who, who is the speaker identified as at the, at the end in that phrase? Let he who has ears to hear, let him hear what? Huh? Spirit. The Spirit. The Spirit says to the churches. So there's a little bit of the Trinitarian thing going on there, right? The speaker is Christ. The speaker is the Spirit. Okay? And they're, yeah. Okay, so now why do we have a pattern like this? And I think the whole point of a lot of the way that the Revelation is written, people have noted uh, the literary quality of it. That's one of the things I saw in my commentaries that I was reading that a lot of the authors will mention that Revelation is incredibly literary and uh, the John, the, the writer, uh, he, he, has, he kind of, he might say even invented his own grammar to write, write this stuff. And it's really clear that he knows Greek grammar, but he doesn't feel confined by it. So he, he's very uh, free with the way he expresses himself. And uh, so we want to think of the whole book as consisting of poetry. And to some extent, I've tried to bring that out. To, to some extent, I have not uh, at this point taken the time. And we'll see that as we go along. But why is, why is it there? Why have, a, why have this kind of structure like this? Uh, which is which is incredibly entertaining and visual and and interesting to me anyway. Um, why do we have it? And I think that God has uh, has taken this genre of poetry and put it to use so that we can see we see things not just intellectually but imaginatively and emotionally. Uh, if you read. Revelation, you see that it, it is very striking at times, uh, incredibly, uh, what's the word, vivid and, and powerful. So it stimulates the imagination and the emotions, and so it's a holistic kind of thing. All right. And, and one of the interesting things we notice is that um, the, these letters can can make a comment by leaving things out, right? So a church that has no commendation, what does that say about that church? <laughs> you know, better get your act together because it's not looking good here. A church that has no critique, what does it say? It says that there is something about this church which is uh, which the Lord finds admirable and wants to affirm, okay? So he can, do, he can do it by leaving things out, which is, I think, pretty cool. Just what he doesn't say. But, of course, what he does say is the, is the meat of it. Okay, let's look at the first one, Ephesus. Um, can somebody read those lines at the top there for us? To the angel of the church in Ephesus, right? The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven Okay, now we see that this is kind of a recapitulation or a, a repetition of the 
of what we just saw, right? Here's the one. Seven stars in his right hand walks among the seven golden lampstands. This is emphasizing involvement. It's, it's like it, he didn't just, you know, he did, didn't just wind the churches up and set them on their way or, or put batteries in them like the Energizer Bunny or something and set them on their way and say, okay, you know, go in peace or something, right? Do well. No, he's right there among them. And this is really important for the church in Ephesus. Ephesus. He knows what's going on in that church, right? Um, so Ephesus um, would represent the original first century church. Uh, and of course, since it was the first century church, it didn't have a lot of uh, tradition or history or what we call, what is it, institutional knowledge. It didn't have any, pretty much, institutional knowledge. Uh, what they had was the, the early stuff, which was unadulterated. They didn't have time to mess it up. On the other hand, they, um, you know, they didn't have a lot of experience. Let's just put it that way. Um, and so they, they understood that true teaching was crucial. And Ephesus had been warned by Paul that ravening wolves would come in among them. And so they were on the lookout for these ravening wolves. Uh, and we'll see that in a minute. But the important thing, too, though, is true teaching is important, but without love it's worthless. Okay, And so the first century church that becomes overly preoccupied with sorting things out and sorting people out according to their grasp of you know, doctrine, such a church can become a loveless church. And that's historically all, always been the case. Churches that are super preoccupied with doctrine and with, uh, with getting it right will uh, be unsympathetic towards people who are seeking to express uh, faith in their own words. Maybe they're not using the right vocabulary. Maybe they're a little off in their way of expression. But instead of coming along and saying, okay, well, let's, you know, let's explore this and see what, what you're trying to get at, they'll often be very hard on, the, on such people. Uh, the, the one that always comes to my mind, which I, I, I may be, I, I, some people may, may take issue with this one, but I remember um, there was a guy, so John Calvin wrote a book called Institutes of the Christian Religion, and a guy named Severtus got hold of a copy and wrote all kinds of notes in it and you know, uh, things that he thought could, could be discussed and debated and, and so on and so forth. And then he sent it to Calvin. And Calvin was utterly furious about this, that anyone would dare to correct his <laughs> masterpiece. And so when Severtus, who was actually not a... He was not exactly the, I don't know, the most stable person in the world. But anyway, he, and he was kind of a weird guy. But anyway, he came to Geneva in disguise. And he had the temerity and the foolishness to actually go to church. And he did it in disguise, but he was, his disguise was penetrated. And um, so he was burned at the stake. And so people have accused Calvin of burning him at the stake. But according to what I heard, Calvin was not guilty of that. He wanted the guy hung, you see, so... Anyway, um, but the point I'm trying to make here, and I, you know, I, I may, you know, I, I'm not trying to. Well, you can tell where my sympathies lie here, but, but um, my point here is that Calvin's extreme uh, concern for doctrinal purity led him to act in ways that I don't think were pleasing to the Lord. You know, to, to put people to death just because they go to church. I don't think that's exactly what Christ would have wanted there. So anyway, let's, let's continue. Can someone read, it, read um, these lines here, verses 2 and 3?
I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. All right, thanks. Okay, you see, now this phrase, I know your works, appears in every letter. And so that's the emphasis here is on he knows what's going on. Christ knows what's going on. Okay, and you see here what we have is some commendations. Uh, toil, patient endurance, uh, can't bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have and found them to be false. Uh, I wish I had looked that word tested up. I'm pretty sure the word tested there, uh, oh gosh, what's the word? I'm trying to remember. So there are two words for tested that appear in, the, in these letters. One of them means tempted, and this one I, I think means uh, the other word, the other kind of word for tested, and I can't remember the Greek word, but uh, it means basically to put, uh, to, to, it's kind of like make sure it lives up to the standard. So this one is the one living up to the standard of, in this case, apostles, right? Now, apostles here are what we call sent ones. He doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean the 12 apostles. It's certainly the 12 apostles were sent ones, but there were lots of apostles in the early church. In fact, there are lots of apostles now. We call them missionaries. Anyone who goes out to plant a church or to start uh, to bring Christ to people, um, who goes out, it's the work done in the church is not a, apostleship usually, but it's the work that's done out among people, evangelism, whatever we want to call it. Um, those are apostles. And, and anyway, so, but, but the apostles would want to be supported by a church, would, like Paul. He, he, worked, he worked from the church in Antioch, and he also would work from local churches to do the ministry he was doing, like Ephesus, for example. All right, so um, he, uh, so anyway, Paul, uh, John is saying that the Ephesians, the Ephesian church was testing those who said they were apostles, found them to be false. Um, but, okay, and, and they were also, um, notice it says they could not bear with those who are evil, but they could bear up. So the word is, that word is repeated. The word, I know, I know your works, I know you are enduring patiently. We have some repetition here. And also the word, uh, where did it go? Patient and toil, toil, uh, I know your works, your toil, that word toil, is actually, um, the word is related to not, you have not grown weary. It, it means you have not grown faint with your work. So it's a, there's a lot of repetition going on here, but it's not always visible because of, of, of the language. <clears throat> anyway, the Ephesians are commended for these things, okay? But, <laughs> can someone read this for us? But I have this again you that you have abandoned the love you have at first. Okay, so this is it. This is the, the critique. And, you know, it seems like a small thing, right? I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Okay, you know, we're, we're not quite the people, you know, we're not quite as whatever, caring or whatever, right? Um, the word, and here's where the names get interesting. I wanted to, I wanted to sh explain to you what I meant earlier about the names. The word um, abandoned here is actually the Greek word, um, af, let's see here, afiemi, afiemi, uh, afiemi. I just want to get the accent right. And it means, um, and the word, the actual word that is in this line is aphakus. And if you listen to it, Ephesus, aphakus, it sounds alike. There's a play on words going on there. So what he's basically saying is 
the Ephesians, uh, Ephesus has, Ephesus has abandoned. Ephesus has abandoned, and that and the words sound alike. Um, the love they had at first, okay. And um, this is a, the reason I bring this up and maybe emphasize a little is all the names of the churches work like this, and we'll see this as we go along. So the Greeks have, a, or the Ephesians have abandoned their first love. They left it behind, okay. And it probably is not is not love for God. Uh, John didn't think of it that way. John would basically think that love for God is revealed by love for one another. And we remember in in, um, in uh, the book of John, um, John tells us that all men will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And similarly, in 1 John, we read that um, uh, how can you how can you say you love the God you have not seen if you hate the brother you have seen? You know, so we have this notion that whoever whoever claims to love God will reveal that love by his love for for one another. And so the Ephesians have lost that; they've lost that love for one another. Um, they've lo- they're not a loving church. Okay, all right, so. Let's see what it says about the consequences of that. Can someone read this this passage? Therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Okay, notice how serious this is. Right? Um... I will remove your lampstand from its place. You know, now you might think to yourself, it's also it's all very symbolic, right? But think about it. You know, what are what are the lampstands? The lampstands are the churches. He's going to take that lampstand out of there. It will not be a church anymore. You see? Why? Because they have lost the thing that mattered the most. They have abandoned it. They've left it behind. Okay. So what does he what does he say? Okay. The first thing he says is, remember, remember therefore from where you have fallen. The premise here is that at one point they were a loving church. And at one point they understood what that meant and they experienced that. Okay. And I would say that most churches. Um, had the had a phase, if you want to call it that, when the people really cared about each other and really loved each other, and there was just that sense of warmth and uh, and and oneness uh, in in the in the particular church. Uh, one of the things that uh, I, I've been going to the church in the CCIC in Cupertino and. Uh, I've really been enjoying it, and part of the reason is uh, I don't have to do anything. (laughs) No responsibilities. But I do do things. I've I've actually wound up uh, teaching Sunday school for the high schoolers, and uh, I uh, give talks about once a month for the youth group, and then I also... uh, I'm leading a men's Bible study there. And the thing about it is it feels like a really nice place. And if I, I get the sense that you know people are do care about each other and do enjoy one another. And they're, as far as I can tell, there isn't any sense of, uh, I don't know, malice or, or, or bitterness or anything of that sort there. You know? So... You know, if I if in ten years it turned into a loveless church, I could think back. Assuming I was alive in ten years, I could think back to this time and say, "Wow, wow! Look how far we have fallen!" Right? Uh, I, I can because anyway. So that's what he's saying. Remember where you were. 
And, and the word fallen there, um, sometimes I'll do grammar here. This is called, uh, it's in the perfect tense. And for those who care, perfect tense in Greek means past action with present effect. Past action completed, completed past action with present effect, okay? Um, generally speaking, there's two kinds of what we would call, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the word. Anyway, um, ah, there's tense and then there's the other one. Ah, aspect. There are generally two kinds of aspect and there are variations on those. Perfect and imperfect. Perfect generally implies completion. Imperfect implies progressive or iterative or whatever. There's also, um, in Greek, there's the undefined um, aspect. So, so Greek present tense is undefined, and Greek what's called aorist tense is undefined. It basically just gives you a snapshot of whatever it is, okay? But Greek perfect tense basically says the action is completed and, and still, the, the results are still relevant, na even now, okay? So what it's saying here is they have fallen and they are still down, you know? They fell and they have not got back up yet, all right? They, they have fallen and are down, okay? Um, and so he says... Uh, and, and so this, this dom their, their condition is dominated by the fact that they let that they gave up their uh, their first love, and so he says you'd better repent and then do what you used to do. So he's not asking them to do anything new. He's not asking them to do to 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 plow new ground or make a new breakthrough into something they've never experienced before. He's saying just do what you used to do. That's all you need to do. If not, your lampstand can be taken away. But notice he repeats again and again. Repent. Remember from where you've fallen. Repent. Do the works you did. I'll come and remove your lampstand unless you repent. So there is a sense of, there's a sense of, okay, look. You guys, I'm telling you what to do here. Just do it. Don't dwell, on, don't dwell on the fact that you're fallen. Remember where you came from and go there again, okay? Okay, this is important here. Um, can someone read this one? Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, Nicolaitans. which I also hate. Okay, yeah, so hate means reject. It doesn't mean he's foaming at the mouth or, oh, I hate those people. Nothing like that. It's simply, I reject this. Okay? And uh, Nicolaitans, again, this is another word that is um, what I call in code. Okay? So you take the word apart to see what it means. Nicolaitans, nikao, um, which means to overcome or conquer. Laos. Laetin, uh, laity, laos, uh, people. So Nicolaitans, it means to overcome or conquer the people. And the way I interpret this, and this is historically speaking, um, the church got, became hierarchical fairly early on. Okay, The original church hierarchy was minimal. They had elders who... Over, were overseers. They they kept an eye on things spiritually. They taught. You know, they they basically were the ones, the stars that were in the hand of Christ. Okay, um, they had they did word ministry. They counseled. They, they you know they tried to keep an eye on people's lives. And then you had what was called deed ministry or deacons. That kind of makes a sense. They were the people who made sure the lights were on, the bills were paid, you know, there was somewhere to meet when we were meeting, you know, they made sure that there was food on the, you know, during the, the, the church love feasts and make sure that the poor people got, that the church wanted to provide for, that that happened, which is one of the interesting things that 
Um, they, they had deacons whose job it was. That is, deacons were people who actually would go out and find people in the church that were in need and, and help them. Okay, this was an early church thing, all right? Anyway, the point was that early on, um, maybe the your late first century, early second century, um, you started winding up with these roles where, for example, the word bishop. Okay, bishops are just elders. It's just, it's the same word, okay? But somehow it became a hierarchical term. That is, bishops are over churches or groups of churches or something along those lines, all right? In a hierarchical way. And you wound up with a priesthood which was totally, sorry, I, I get a little frustrated with this because um, the plain teaching of the Bible is we are all priests. And one of the things you'll see even in the book of Revelation is he has made us priests, right? It says that, it says that in the first, the first chapter. First Peter talks about us being priests. Not that there are priests and then there are laity, but that we're all priests, okay? Um, and then we have the beginning of Revelation, John, uh, uh, Revelation 1.9, I, John, your brother, and then he goes on, your brother and partner in the, you know, gives the different things. John is the, you know, this, this elder guy who has all this knowledge, all this, this, these visions, this wisdom, I'm just your brother. I'm your brother. I'm not above you. You see? You guys are my peers. From God's point of view, it's all it's a matter of role, not of position. I play the role of being an elder, you know, all of this kind of stuff. But part of the part of the job of the church leadership is to facilitate the ministry of the, the saints. You know, to train, to equip, so that the, the whole church can do the things that, that Christ intends for it to do. And, and I can go on and on about that, but I won't because uh, I'm running out of time. And, um, but I want to make one, I want to read one other part here. John 20, 17. Jesus said to her, this is Mary Magdalene, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Now look, listen to this, guys. Very few people talk about this, but here it is. Jesus said, say to them, say to my, go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now, he, what, what is he doing there? What is he doing? This is something that people, that kind of, kind of sh makes people's mental fuses blow. Jesus is establishing himself as a peer of the disciples, the apostles. Your brother and, or your father and my father, or my father and your father, my God and your God, my brothers, you know, there is, this, there is this level. We're all on this level with Jesus. I know that, that like I said, you, maybe some fuses are blowing out there. Also, Jesus said, I don't call you, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. That's in John also. Okay. John, in, um, in the book of John, Jesus goes out of his way to establish a peer relationship with, his, with you know, the, the believers. Now, obviously, um, as we you know, read the book of, of Revelation, uh, Jesus has an incredible majesty and power about him. And the, the other thing that John says is, at some point, he says, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. We're going to be like the Jesus who 
appears in the book of Revelation. I mean, I know this may sound weird to you, but I, I don't know what else to make of what the Bible says here. We are on a peer level with Jesus, okay? Brother, he is our brother, okay? Well, you know, the, the idea that there's a hierarchy in the church, that there are, there are special people, and then there's, you know, it's like the old saying, uh, the, the clergy is paid to be good, and the, uh, the laity is good for nothing. But anyway, wow, are you guys tired? Did anybody get that? <laughs> All right. Okay, <laughs> let's, uh, someone, can someone read this passage for us? Verse 7. He who is in the air, <clears throat> let him hear what the Spirit said to, to the churches. To the one who overcomes or conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. Right. Okay, so again, this is basically conquers, overcomes, it, it is the same word, nikao, right, which we saw in Nicolaitan, which is, I think, there is, I think the repetition of the word, it may just be incidental, but it, it seems to emphasize the fact that it, there's this element of overcoming in that word, okay? But if we overcome in the way that God wants us to, we will get to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, and he's look, this is not looking forward, this is looking back. We came from the paradise of God. We had the chance to eat the tree of life back in the garden, right? Back in the garden before we lost that, you see. He's saying you'll get it back. The things that you lost, the things that you abandoned, those things will be, you'll be given them again, you see. And so, again, this is the reversal of Ephesus. Ephesus. This is a reversal of the loss or abandonment. Okay? So you see, the, this is like a pattern and how, it, how everything fits together, right? Um, we start off with the Christ who knows what we're up to. And then we have this, this um, um, commendation over various things. And then the critique, which turns out to be really important. And then, and then of course, the, um, the Ephesians reject the hierarchicalism. They're not Nicolaitans. And so they are commended for that. Uh, and they're, they're, they basically have to repent, but there's still kind of, there's still hope for them. All right? Okay. I think we can do, we'll do one more. I don't think we'll take this long on it. If we do, and no, we won't take this long. Okay, Smyrna, Smyrna. Can someone read this one for us? To the angel of the church in Smyrna write the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Okay, so Smyrna is like myrrh. You see how, the, again, the name is, re, is, is reflective of the letter. Smyrna is the suffering, persecuted church where they're being killed for the faith, okay? They're, and so myrrh is, was used for, for embalming bodies and it, it kept them from smelling too bad. Uh, and so everything about this letter is in relation to death and life, okay? And so the one who's speaking is the first and the last that is Jesus, who died and came to life. So this is, the, this is the hope of the persecuted church. That is, we follow the one who died and came to life. Death is not the last word. There is a word after the word of death, right? Jesus is the first and the last. Jesus is the last word. And what is that last word? It's life, okay? Can I get someone to read this for us? I know you're tribulating. 
I know your tribulations and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Okay, so this is, this is one of the things that was going on at the time, and I probably have mentioned this before. The Jews, were, uh, the Jews who opposed the Christians, because obviously the Christians were... The Christians, for the Jews, the Christians were like, I don't know, what's a good example? Jehovah's Witnesses or something like that. The Christians had a teaching that was different from, um, from the Jews. Actually, it was the fulfillment of the teaching of the Jews, but because the Jews rejected their Messiah, the Jews thought that the Christians were leading the people astray. Okay, And so um, the Jews said that the Christians were not Jews. And this was important because uh, in that day, the Romans had an edict or they had a, a law which basically said that the Jews were allowed to practice their religion without molestation. The Jews would not be persecuted for practicing the Jewish religion. And the Jews had kind of earned that right by refusing to knuckle under to the Romans. The Romans finally decided it would be less trouble to tolerate them than to try to get them to obey all the Roman religious practices. And we have to keep in mind that the... the um, Emperor worship was a thing back during this time. Now it was kind of it kind of depended on what part of the emperor empire you were in, as to what as to how strong it was. But in this part of the empire, the Asia Minor, it was pretty strong. Some of them, some of it was very strong in some of those cities. And so anyway, um, if the Christians were not Jews, then they wouldn't be under the law that said that they didn't have to follow the Roman uh, religious practices, in particular emperor worship. And if they had to do emperor worship, they wouldn't do it, and they would end up being punished or even killed for refusal to do it. Okay, That was what was going on. So when the Jews were saying to the Romans that the Christians were not Jews, they were trying to get them in legal trouble. And, um, and so that's why they were called a synagogue of Satan. Satan was the accuser of the saints. Satan, we'll see that uh, in, in chapter 12, he's identified as the accuser of the saints. All right. Remember back in the book of Job, Job, Satan was accusing Job to God. Satan plays the role of accusation. That's his number one rule. He's the adversary, legally and in every other way. He's your enemy. He's trying to get you in trouble, or he's just trying to mess you up as best he can. Okay, so, um, yes. Uh, so there, So uh, John calls them a synagogue of Satan. Uh, he, he, he quotes Jesus as calling them a synagogue of Satan because they're accusing the Christians, all right? And the Christians might have to die as a result. All right. So, um, can somebody read this for us? Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you will be, you you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Okay, we see, so we see this word tested here. It's a different word from the previous place where we saw it. This means tempted. Satan is going to tempt, um, uh, tempt the Christians, tempt them to, you know, they're in prison. So, if, oh, come on, just, just a little, you know, just a little drop of wine, you know. That's all you have to do, a little drop of wine, a little libation to Caesar. That's all you have to do. It's so simple. You know, or or you you could just say hail Caesar, you know, and you're good, good for good for another year, you know, and 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 so that's the temptation. The temptation is you can get out of trouble, you can be free and clear. All you have to do is just that little thing. Um, and and so 
the point is that they were called to this testing or tempting. And it says for 10 days. Now, 10 days is longer than seven days. It's important to understand that this is a fairly long time, but it's a definite fixed period, okay? It's not like it's going to go on forever. That's, whenever you see a number like this in Revelation, um, it always means a fixed number, okay? It always means something limited. So some, some places it says a third of the fish will die. Well, that means a fixed amount, not all of them, less than half of them, in fact. You know, it says that you'll see that as we go along. And this is a pattern we find in the book, that these numbers are given to represent uh, fixed and limited amounts. Though this is a long one, it's still limited. All right? And it's faithful unto death. In other words, you might have to die here. Are you willing to die for the one who died for you? It's not that he's putting, he's trying to kill you. It's that your enemy, the devil, is trying to kill you. And trying to tempt you and trying to get you to fall away. And he's saying, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. You see, there's this life and death thing going on here. That's the whole point of this church. This is the persecuted church. This is where it's life and death. Okay? All right. Can we get someone to read this? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Okay. I think that's the last one, yeah. Okay, so... Um, the one who conquers, the one who overcomes, the one who doesn't give in to temptation will not be hurt by the second death. Well, we haven't got to that yet, have we? But there's something that will appear later on in the book called the second death. How many of you, have any of you seen the movie Coco? What, yeah. Okay, you remember in, the, in Coco there was a second death, right? When you were forgotten by everybody and everything, you would just kind of, you know... If it were only that easy. Because <laughs> the second death here is, is, is the lake of fire. Okay. And we'll talk about that later. But anyway, not tonight. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so. But that, this is held out as a hope. So there is a worldly consequence of following Jesus. And that is up to and including death. There's an eternal con, uh, consequence to being faithful. And that is that the death that you experience now will not be, was only temporary and will soon be, will soon be over. And then there's no other death that will be able to, uh, will be able to touch you. And I, I, really, I'm re, I really find this hopeful. I, one of the things that as, as I go through, you know, the waning period of my life, you know, the days are numbered kind of thing, I, I realize there, there's, very little, there's very little in this world that I have to hope for. You know what I mean? I'm not going to become rich. I'm not going to become famous. I'm, well, I might become famous in some negative way. I don't know, but I hope not. Uh, I'm not going to become uh, a great, you know, chess player or basketball player or politician or, you know, any of those things. Worldly fame and fortune is not going to be mine. What do I have to hope for? You know, why do I, why do I get out of, why do I come here? You know, it's like I was talking to Daniel and Daniel was saying, well, I, you know, you're, I'm, I'm going to be 70 in August, you know. And, and he says, you know, you're one of the most active 70-year-olds that I know of. I was saying, oh, man, it's so hard for me to do anything. I just feel like, man, I feel like I can't do, do that much, you know. I want to do more. I don't know, you know. And he says, my son, da you know, Daniel, he says, you're one of the most active 70-year-olds I know. And I say, really? <laughs> anyway, but that's, 
I mean, in other words, why do I want to do this? Why don't I just sit at home and watch uh, Korean dramas? I like Korean dramas. I just <laughs> why don't I just sit at home all day and watch? Or like my wife. My wife reads uh, Chinese fantasy. No you know those those fantasy novels uh, like Condor Heroes and I don't. know. You guys know those? Uh, yeah, she reads those all the time. You know, I could read science fiction books. Why not? Because I have this hope. Why do I do this other stuff? Why do I still seek after Christ and so on? I'm not saying my wife is not doing that. But I'm saying, like, I do watch a lot of Korean dramas and stuff. But why don't I spend all my time doing that? Because I have something, something to look forward to. I, my work here will not be forgotten, you know. Okay, so... Anyway, we're going to stop here and we'll pick up next week and do the the rest of the churches. You basically have the idea. Okay, uh, are there any questions and, and comments and so on and so forth? What is the uh, second death? Okay, um, the second death gets described later. And um, it's the lake of fire. And so the, so the idea, I mean, it is kind of like the movie Coco. There's a death, there's physical death. And then there is uh, a second death, which is, you might say, a spiritual death or a holistic. It gets, so, so the way I look at, personally, all right, this is my opinion about how this stuff works. Um, I believe that if you look at if you look at the analogies or the the metaphors used for for hell in the New Testament, um, it usually involves um, like fire, some kind of fire. Now, oh, I got to show you guys something. I I was gonna. Can you guys see this? Can you guys see that very well? It, it's uh, it's one of the Far Side cartoons. Um, and the caption says, "Oh man, the coffee's cold. They think of e they've thought of everything." So he's in hell, right? You, and he says, "You know, you're expecting okay. At least the coffee will be hot in hell, right?" Oh man, the coffee's cold. They thought of everything, right? Anyway, I I, I like that cartoon. Um, Far Side has a lot of cartoons about hell, and it's. Hell is not a laughing matter. Let's be honest here. Um, the but the question the question is whether um, hell is involves um, eternal conscious torment. And my take is that if you see if you listen to the the, the like for example when Jesus talks about hell the word usually translated as hell is Gehenna. And Gehenna is the garbage dump that they kept burning all the time. Why did they burn it? Because it was for sanitary reasons. They would burn the corpses, burn all the unclean things. They, they wanted to burn that stuff up so it wouldn't be a festering pit of corruption and disease, right? And so you, if something went into Gehenna, it never came out, okay? It's, it says that the, the worm does not, the fire is not quenched and the worm does not die. That's from Isaiah, and Jesus mentioned that. But the idea is that what, are, what is the worm that he's talking about? He's ta it's the grave worms, the corpse worms that are eating up the, the dead flesh, right? I know it's gruesome and grotesque. But the idea is something goes into Gehenna and gets burned up or, or goes away. You never see it again. Similarly, the lake of fire. If it goes in the lake of fire, it does not come out. Right? I mean, it's a dead end. Literally. Dead is the word that we, the operative word here, right? So the point is that it's, it's got to go somewhere. I mean, if you're not, if you're not going to be, if God is all in all, what if you don't want God? Where do you go? There doesn't really seem to be anywhere to go, right? If God's everywhere, 
you've got to find a place that's nowhere. And nowhere is nothing. I mean, you see, all, the only thing you can say about hell, you can only speak about it in negative terms. It's the place where God is... Some people have said, hell, heaven is where we say to God, your will be done. Hell is where God says to us, your will be done. And, and I don't know if I agree, I don't really agree with that. I just think that hell, I kind of think of hell as the place where we are left to ourselves. But we have no source of life, no source of, of anything, really. You know, there is no, uh, there's no relationship. There's, there's no, hell is no place. Doesn't mean it is not a state, but it is not a place because a place is where people can relate to one another. What makes, what makes a banquet a place? It's the people who are there, right? It's the, a banquet, you could have a banquet anywhere. You could have it at one restaurant or another restaurant or somebody's house or, you know, whatever. It, what matters is the people who are there. And heaven is like that. Heaven is where God is and God's people are, okay? Hell is where God is not and where God's people are not, you see. And that's death. That's the way I see it. I, 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 it's hard to get any more concrete than that because, but anyway, yes. Okay, any more questions? Hey, Fred, you're talking about hierarchies in, at the church that don't have, they should not have a lot of hierarchy, right? Hierarchy, yeah. yeah. Like, how about Catholic church? Shouldn't like they have a lot? Yeah, that, I think the Catholic, see the Catholic church, historically speaking, is a direct descendant of the process I was talking about when the church became hierarchical. The, the Catholic church is, is hierarchical. They have a pope, and then they have the arch, archbishops, whatever they are, and then you, you know, they have priests and so on and so forth, right? And it's very, it's very structured and legal and so on and so forth, yeah. And, there, and so one thing, for example, I was reading about the uh, Lord's Table, and they said that, well, the Catholics have something called the Eucharist, which is, a, uh, which is not in the Bible. Um, it is when they reenact the sacrifice of Christ. And so they have the, the bread and the wine. They have a piece of bread and wine, whatever. And they elevate it, and they offer it up to God, which is, and in that moment, it becomes the body and blood of Jesus according to the Catholics, which there's nothing like this in the Bible, okay? The closest they come to is when Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. This is the blood of the new, this is the blood of the new covenant, the new covenant in my blood. But he was standing there, so he was clearly speaking metaphorically. I hold up a piece of bread. This is my body. But here's my body right here. So literally, this is my body. This is a symbol. And what's it a symbol of? Of my death. All right, so why, did I, why am I mentioning this? Because the Catholics say only the priest can do the Eucharist or the Lord's table, which, which implies that they're different. Only the priest. So let's say you have a bunch of your brothers and sisters in Christ and you get together at somebody's house and you share bread and wine or whatever you want to use, you can't do that. There's no priest there, according to the Catholics. Whereas there's, there is every indication in the, in the New Testament that they were constantly doing this. It, it, read Acts chapter 2, you see. So the point I'm trying to make is you need a priest to do sacrifices. So the, if the Eucharist is a reenactment of a sacrifice, you need a priest for that, right? The whole thing is, it, the whole thing, it's like, it is so far from, removed from the New Testament, but, and, and that's where the hierarchicalism comes in. If you don't have a priest, how are you going to get the sacraments? You see? So you need the priest. Oh my gosh, I need a priest, you see? Well, that's not what the New Testament teaches. 
we are all priests, um, brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, Paul says, Paul to the Corinthians says, I don't lord it over your faith. You know, yeah. So, yeah, so I'm not very much a fan of the of that Catholics because I think, or because I think they they've gone a long way down a weird road, and I think they're they're struggling because of it. We will run. A, we'll talk about what I believe is the Catholic Church in this uh, in the seven churches. So yeah. Any more questions? All right. Uh, well, we'll do some more churches next week. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll get through them. All right. Yeah. All right, let's pray. Lord, I just pray that uh, regardless of uh, what your uh, what the details uh, mean here, and I hope that I'm doing a good job of interpreting them, but I pray that regardless of whether um, every detail I'm, I'm explaining here is correct, that your word will still uh, perform its purpose We'll still learn to be churches where there's love, um, churches that are that care about the truth but care also about love, churches where we can be brothers and sisters, and not rule over one another, churches where um, we're willing to follow you even to the point of death, where we have the hope of uh, of the new the new life to come, and and the, that we will avoid the second death but that we'll have an eternity, eternity with you. So, Father, I pray that as we continue to read about your, the letters to the churches, that we would continue to glean these uh, insights and, and uh, uh, counsel and exhortation from them. And I pray that we would find ways to apply them in our own uh, churches and our own attitudes towards one another. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.